Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at Brock Palin, all one word. That's Palin with an E, not with an I. That's been a common mistake lately. Uh, I also have here Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and OpenMPI. And I keep forgetting, H.W. Loke. He's also H.W. Loke. That's right. So, um... I saw Bryce sent out an email that uh, he's going to be at SC, so you can meet the HW Lope guys and some other guests that we've had on the show before. Oh, and he's uh, giving a talk in a Cisco booth. Oh, he's he going to give a talk about HW Lope in the Cisco booth. So come there, get your free Cisco shirt, and if you're lucky, get your free RCE shirt. Oh yeah, yeah, we have the RCE uh, shirts to give away. Both of both of us will have some. Um, you will be uh, Jeff will be around the Cisco booth, and I will be just floating around all over the place as Michigan does not have a booth. So, okay, so our guest today is Daniel Templeton, who uh, of formerly of Sun, now of Oracle, representing the Oracle Grid Engine, formerly Sun Grid Engine, and hopefully a lot of this confusion with the transition of Sun into Oracle, Dan can set us straight. So, uh, Dan, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Sure. So, um, yeah, I've, uh, I've, I've been at Sun for, well, way too long. I, uh, I uh, drank quite a bit of the Kool-Aid and bled Sun Blue for, for uh, many, many years. I uh, started out in the Grid Engine team as one of the developers and then just kind of uh, couldn't keep my mouth shut and eventually ended up as the product manager, which is uh, where I sit today now at Oracle. Okay, so you've been um, product manager of SGE, OGE. What is the... Uh, I, I, I've seen Oracle Grid Engine out there. A lot of people still call it Sun Grid Engine. Um, what is the official name of it right now? Is it, is it Oracle Grid Engine? The, the official name is Oracle Grid Engine, although all of the binaries are still uh, acronymed to SGE. So if you look in the, the you know the SGE Q Master, SGE Exec D, etc., uh, and I don't think we're actually going to change that. Okay, so can you give us a rundown? What is uh, OGE? Is a scheduler, or resource manager, uh, a product like Globus? What what is it? Um, well, so OGE is it's the alpha and the omega. Uh, it is uh, the, the the universal resource manager. Uh, the the whole idea of uh, Grid Engine and and the, uh, the the other similar products that are out there is to take a set of resources and a set of incoming workload and make the best use of those resources to satisfy that workload. And the the place where uh, Grid Engine really shines is when you have, say, multiple users from multiple different organizations running multiple different uh, applications, and they're all competing over those resources. And the more users and groups and applications you throw at it, the more interesting Grid Engine gets because scalability is one of our hallmarks. So what what's the history of SGE and OGE and you know how did you come to be where you are today where did you start from and all that Yeah so well Grid Engine uh came about as a, a company founded in Germany uh in 1990 maybe 1989 uh the way, way back when Grid Engine is a a very old very mature product at this point um, Sun picked the company up in 99, I believe it was, and then uh, released the first open source version of it in 2001. So it was actually a closed source product prior to Sun's acquisition of, uh, of Gridware. And uh, then Sun opened it up in 2001, uh, so we had the product and then also the Grid Engine open source project. And uh, that went on merrily for a while under a variety of names. It had been Sun Grid Engine, Sun Grid Engine Enterprise Edition, Sun in One Grid Engine, back to Sun Grid Engine. And then the Oracle acquisition happened, and now we are Oracle Grid Engine, and uh, we, we now it's actually okay to just colloquially call it Grid Engine. Well, that certainly simplifies things quite a bit. So you, you mentioned uh, a second ago that scalability is one of your trademarks. What do you, what do you mean by that remark? Um, well, so if you go look, uh, for example, one of our uh, uh, top customers, that if you've ever talked to anyone from Sun, uh, in the first three minutes of the conversation, they will bring up uh, Texas Advanced Computing Center. Uh, we were all brainwashed to do that. Uh, Texas Advanced Computing Center's uh, Ranger system, which debuted, I think, at number three on the top 500 list, uh, is 63,000 cores running under a single grid engine uh, master. Uh, it's uh, Grid Engine is designed for scalability in these cutting edge HPC type environments. Right? Um, TAC is the largest system in deployment that I'm aware of, but they uh, have they are far from the ceiling of the product's capabilities. 
So when you say scalability, do you mean scalability of cores or scalability of queue depths or policy limits or what, what exactly do you mean by scalability? Because frequently just, you know, that word is kind of bandied about without real, you know, strict definitions. Sure. So, well, actually, I, I, I mean in all categories, although not necessarily all at the same time. Um, so if you look at, for example, uh, we've got a customer uh, in the EDA software space that's doing 30-some-odd million jobs a month um, in a relatively small cluster. Um, so throughput, we can handle a, a really decent number. We can handle a really decent queue depth, um, particularly if you get into parametric or array jobs. Grid Engine does that better than than most other schedulers out there. The way the way we treat a uh, an array job, you know, a million task array job is no different than a one task array job to us. And so you, you get really great scalability uh, with regard to array jobs or parametric jobs. But e even uh, even so, you talk about a queue depth of a few hundred thousand jobs. That's that's not a big deal. Um, and yeah, and based on cores and uh, uh, for us. Scalability is really the, the deciding factors are queue depth and number of machines that you're managing. It really doesn't matter how many slots are on those machines, right? Because slots for us is, is a very arbitrary concept. So you know whether these machines are single core or 16 core is, is irrelevant as far as scalability goes. So what about managing uh, dispersed systems? You call it a grid engine, and a lot of people think of grids as dispersed machines, volunteer computing, something like that. Uh, How does it compare to something like, say, Boink or uh, Condor? So, uh, well, I, it's, uh, it's kind of a philosophical difference, I, I think, between, say, uh, grid engine and Condor. Um, grid engine does not assume that it is strewn out all across the world um, in the way that some of the grid purists uh, might define grid. And so this is grid, grid was as uh, specifically defined back in the day that grid engine was named grid engine um, as cloud is specifically defined today. Right? It wasn't. There, there's no specificity to the definition then, and there isn't now. Um, so what we consider grid is being able to put your machines together to aggregate the compute, aggregate the resources, and derive greater business value out of it. Um, we do differ from the, the grid purists who uh, uh, say, you know, it's not a grid unless you've got a machine in London and a machine in Tokyo and, and the, the master sitting in California and everybody's uh, sharing work around. And uh, in a large degree, that's because in a practical sense, that's just really hard, not necessarily from the uh, scheduler's perspective, but from the making use of it perspective, because it's all about the data, right? And you don't want to go ship terabytes of data all over the world. That, that's just a bad thing. Um, so, you know, looking at things like Condor, Condor is more of a, uh, like you said, a voluntary system where a uh, uh, the nodes are independent and are volunteering to participate in a cluster so that uh, everybody can get some work done, kind of like a SETI at home-ish sort of attitude. Uh, whereas Grid Engine assumes that there is a set amount of dedicated resources. This is in a data center. There is a master that owns the machines, and it's more of a, a union model, right? It's, uh, the, the, the orders are passed down from above, and the, the nodes that are in the, the compute grid are slaved to the master. Okay, so would you say that the philosophy is similar to more like Slurm, Torque, uh, some of the other resource managers that are out there? Absolutely. Okay, so can you integrate, um, so you said that you have a scheduler. Uh, how complex a scheduling can you do? Uh, Grid Engine supports about as uh, complex a scheduling as, as, <laughs> as anyone would be capable of understanding. Uh, one of the problems that you can easily get yourself into with Grid Engine is there are so many knobs and, and switches and buttons to play with on the scheduler that uh, you can end up with configurations that either make that are so complex that you can't tell if they're working or they're so complex that they're that they're not particularly useful but we support we support all the the good stuff the fair share scheduling of a couple of different varieties you know ticket based policies um, being able to do fine grain uh, resource quotas uh, being able to do advance reservation um, resource reservation to prevent starvation of large jobs um, Pretty much anything that's out there in uh, uh, the other scheduler systems as far as uh, scheduling capabilities, we also support. 
And we're, we're looking, uh, going forward, we're looking at doing some, some really interesting things. We've got a guy from, uh, from the old Sun Labs group who uh, has done nothing all his life but scheduling work. And uh, we're working with this guy to uh, apply some of his uh, uh, experience and uh, skill set around uh, the, the mathematical aspects of scheduling to do some really, uh, really interesting stuff with Grid Engine. We'll, we'll see where that goes. So what's the actual architecture of this? Is the queue and scheduler all one process? Or are they independent? Um, what actually goes on a compute node? What goes on a submit host? That's actually one of my favorite questions because uh, I think we have a particularly good answer for that. So with Grid Engine, you've got a master process. The, the queue master is a multi-threaded daemon. The scheduler is a thread in the queue master. It's got a couple of threads for handling incoming communications and a couple of threads for handling events and so on and so forth. So you, you've actually got um, the uh, uh, advantages of a fully multi-threaded master, which um, not a lot of the other DRM systems have gone through that pain. We went through that pain around about 2005. It sucked, but... We're, we're on the other side of it now, and we're able to leverage the uh, advantages of having that, uh, that multi-thread architecture. On the client side, there is a daemon that runs, and again, multi-threaded uh, with regard to communication. Um, so you've got, in total, a master daemon, and then on each execution node, there is an execution daemon. Uh, there is one port that you open for the master. There is one port that you open for the execution daemon. All very, very simple to keep track of. So let me uh, change direction here a little bit and ask about the, the elephant here in the room. So there's been a there's been a bit of a brouhaha on on the interwebs about uh, uh, the licensing issues, and there's been talk of a fork uh, on the open source side. What what can you tell us about this? Can you clarify any of the rhetoric that's been going around about you know it's, there are people who are talking who are angry and not necessarily uh, talking with their brains. So uh, I wonder if you could just kind of <laughs> clarify the whole situation for us. Yeah, well, you know, it's. I'm not sure that anybody's really all that angry. I think people are just a, a little bit uh, um, confused about what's going on, and and right, rightly so. Um, so there's a couple of different uh, issues that are coming up there. So one is, is Grid Engine alive? Absolutely, hell yes. Um, we've got a roadmap coming up that I think is going to be really interesting. Um, you know, it, it's we can get into this a little bit later, and I think we will. But it's it's fairly logically what you would expect a company like Oracle to do with a product like Grid Engine. Um, the, the other part of it is, is okay, it's not free anymore. Um, it hadn't actually been free for a while now. It's been maybe two years that it's not been free. Um, Sun had this, this phase that we went through where everything was free. Uh, we were going to give it all away for free and make, it, make up for it in volume um, somehow. I'm not sure how that was going to work. And uh, for Grid Engine, it really didn't work. And we actually exited that a, uh, a, a, quite a while back. So Grid Engine has been under a 90-day eval license uh, as opposed to the free for everything forever uh, license since 6.2 update 2, I believe. Um, so that, that's, uh, people are only just now discovering that, and I'm not sure how that uh, slipped by. Uh, we, it's not like we uh, kept it a secret. Um, so anyway, that's, that's uh, the, the second thing. And then the third thing is what's going on with the open source. Um, no, it's no big secret if you go out to the open source website and you go look at the CBS logs, we haven't checked in anything since the acquisition. Um, that you can take for, for what, it, what it is. Um, I, I honestly can't say whether we're going to uh, continue contributing to the open source, you know, if we're going to go do a delayed commit. Um, if we're going to be able to adopt like the MySQL model of doing open core, um, if we're going to do something like the Solaris model where they're, they're uh, doing delayed commits. Uh, right, right now, we're obviously not doing any commits, and uh, I don't know where we're going to go from here. The, the forks, um, there's actually, I, I think there's two forks now, if I'm reading this correctly, I, I saw on the, uh, the, the mailing list today. So there's a uh, open grid scheduler fork, which uh, I love the guys that are doing the fork, right? One of the things, one of the great things about Grid Engine has always been the community. And so, you know, I, I'm annoyed that there's a fork, but I love the guys that are doing it. So you know, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't be annoyed with it, really. 
Um, so Open Grid Scheduler, they're going to try and have a release of that before supercomputing. Um, and there's another one that just came up. I, I find this amusing. They call it SGE, the son of grid engine scheduler. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, um, go out to the mailing list. Uh, they uh, just sent out the link. It was uh, last night or this morning for that one. Um, and, you know, so if Grid Engine um, lives on, if, if they fork off the open source and it lives on uh, that way, that's fine. Um, the, the plans, at least for Open Grid Scheduler, is that it's a, uh, a worst-case scenario fork. In other words, they're doing the fork just in case Oracle decides not to return to committing to the open source. And at any point that Oracle does finally come back to doing it, they're willing to just give up and go back to whatever, whatever the, uh, the, the main source base is that Oracle's offering. Okay, well, that's, that's fair enough. Um, so then let me ask, what do you guys get out of the community? So if you haven't really given anything uh, back code-wise, what is Sun slash Oracle's participation? Um, well, so we're, we're aside from the contributing, we're still doing uh, all the participation that we always did. So the Grid Engine community is uh, built up around the mailing lists on the open source site. And uh, the, we're still participating full bore on uh, answering questions, helping customers, uh, you know, figuring stuff out, uh, helping guys get up to speed on Grid Engine uh, on, that, on those aliases. So the only thing that's really changed since the acquisition is that we're not pushing the source code out right now uh, to the, the open source site. Um, so what we get out of the community, the, the community, you know, so I've, I've been in this team since the, the just after the point where they open sourced. And uh, it's been really interesting to watch the community grow up around these mailing lists. Back when I first joined, it, it was a mandate that all of the developers uh, would listen in on the alias and answer questions. Right? We were trying to build this community. And at this point, it's rare that one of the product engineers actually gets to answer a question because the community is self-supporting at this point. We've got some really impressive folks who... I, you know, I don't know what their day jobs are because they know more about grid engine than, than any one person should. And they're, they're prompt to answer questions 24 hours a day. So um, we, we've got a really strong community. And you know, these, these are actually the guys who are uh, out there doing the fork, too, because they're highly invested in grid engine. So it's going to be a little bit interesting to see how, this, uh, 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 how the community manages divide, to divide itself among the the, the three current source bases for Grid Engine uh, out there in the open source. And I'm going to do what I can to try and get, get all of that unified in some sensible way. Right? We, the, the last thing we want to do is, is have this thing uh, fracture and fragment into a, a non-useful community. Okay, so we talked about the, the status of OGE, SGE, and um, what some of his features were. Oh, what is... When going back to compare to some of the other resource managers and schedulers out there, what would you say is the biggest strength of uh, OGE versus some of the other products you've seen? Uh, well, so it kind of depends on exactly uh, uh, which one you're comparing against because they all have their own uh, unique spin on uh, on how they approach the problem. Um, Grid Engine, the, the things we do really well, uh, awesome at scalability, uh, ex uh, obscenely flexible, I would even say. Um, gr grid Engine is flexible to the point that there are more things that you can tweak than most people uh, understand. Uh, it's, it's kind of funny. I've been on this product now for uh, just about eight years, and still about every month I will come across a feature and go, wow, I had no idea it could do that. Um, there is, there's so much stuff buried in there, um, th and a lot of it is around the ability to configure it in interesting and unusual ways. Um, I, for example, well, once upon a time, I used Grid Engine. I, I, uh, this is a really inappropriate use of Grid Engine, but it was uh, a fun use. I uh, set up Grid Engine as a way to manage an application server cluster. So uh, as the uh, latency on HTTP requests went up, uh, Grid Engine would automatically go start new app server instances. And it was it was a, a really odd bastardization of of uh, the the concept of a grid scheduler, but because of the flexibility that Grid Engine offers, it was it was not a, a particularly challenging thing to set up. 
Um, so other things that we uh, uh, do well is, you know, Grid Engine is zero touch, right? You don't modify your applications. You don't recompile. You don't relink. You just, you just run them. Right? The, the applications, for the most part, don't even know that uh, Grid Engine's there. Uh, one of the things that we do really uh, interestingly now is uh, focus on Hadoop. So Hadoop is this great technology that everybody's uh, uh, interested in, but it's, it's a very, very young technology. And it's still kind of at the point where it's neat for developers, but as you start trying to talk to the IT guys about Hadoop, there's some real obvious issues that come up. Um, and oddly, uh, or maybe uh, uh, serendipitously, uh, Grid Engine actually plugs all those holes. So if you use Grid Engine as the framework on which Hadoop runs, most of the issues with running Hadoop in a uh, enterprise IT environment kind of go away. Uh, so there's some really interesting opportunities that are uh, cropping up around Grid Engine and our support for uh, the, the Hadoop environment. So talk to me, though, shifting back a little bit to HPC, talk to me about the zero touch uh, with regard to MPI applications. How's your integration with various MPI implementations out there? So that, that goes back to the flexibility thing. Um, I am not uh, aware off the top of my head of an MPI that we aren't able to support. Um, we effectively have the same, uh, let me rephrase that, Platform LSF effectively has the same uh, uh, MPI integration framework that, uh, that, that we do. Um, it is a script-based uh, framework that you can go uh, do whatever you need to do to get an MPI to work. Uh, some of the MPIs, like the ones based on Open MPI, are natively aware of Grid Engine. Uh, for the ones that aren't, you just go out uh, mostly to actually the open source community, uh, where we've got how tos posted on. Um, you know, th th these are the scripts that you need to uh, put around your MPI implementation to get it to work with uh, Grid Engine. And then we've got customers that are kind of pushing the boundaries on uh, what you can do with MPI as far as uh, being able to suspend and resume things and, and uh, what their needs are. So um, MPI is certainly something that we support and we support well. So you mentioned that you had used SGE to automatically kick on more of these uh, application server instances. What's entailed with doing that, like having SGE kind of monitor a state of something instead of a user driving a queue, um, pushing jobs into a queue? So uh, let's see. So I could give you the answer of, of what it is I actually did, which was I think I probably did this back in 2004. Um, or I could tell you what the current way to do things are uh, or is, which is uh, probably the more useful thing to do. So somewhere around 2005, 2006, we introduced this uh, new sub-module for Grid Engine called uh, Service Domain Manager. And uh, Service Domain Manager is kind of the corollary to Grid Engine except for services. So Grid Engine is about making sure your jobs get done, right? And a job is something that goes out, executes, and ends. Right. Whereas a service is something that you hand over and you really don't want it to end. In fact, you might want it to uh, uh, multiply out across other servers, uh, across other hosts, uh, based on the, the incoming workload. So, a service domain manager is this thing that sits there and brokers resources among services, and it actually considers Grid Engine to be a service that it brokers. So you could, for example, uh, have an app application server cluster that has a uh, service domain manager watching it, and it's sitting beside maybe your Grid Engine cluster. And you know, depending on which one's busier and which one's more important, uh, the resources may migrate from one side to the other. Um, something that we're going to be coming out with uh, very soon here is uh, a, a friendlier uh, generic uh, service adapter plug-in for service domain managers so that you can uh, do that kind of integration with whatever services you have at a scripting level without having to write any code. Um, so the, the other the interesting thing, there's a couple interesting things that service domain manager brings to the table um, aside from the, the ability to broker resources among services. Um, one of them is that it can plug into the cloud automatically. So it essentially is able to treat uh, a, a cloud service provider such as Amazon EC2 as a service that never has demands of its own, but always has free resources to share. And uh, it can also do power management, um, where essentially you, you, you create your own 
um, greedy cloud, if you will, that always wants resources, and when it gets them, it powers them down. And uh, when those resources are needed by another service, then it can power them back up and hand them back. So you get some really interesting opportunities for cost savings, both by reducing operating costs through turning things off that you don't need at the moment and, and also not having to uh, buy the machines in the first place so you, uh, you know, farm out your peak capacity to the cloud where that's relevant. So you always have to throw in that big caveat because the hybrid cloud model is far from ubiquitous. Well, let me ask you another forward-looking question because a, a particular – uh, feature that I've been working on over the past couple of months for OpenMPI is revamping our support for processor and memory affinity. Um, simply because, for example, Cisco even sells servers right now with 64 cores, right? And so, I'm sorry, 32 cores and 64 hyper threads. Um, core count is going up. What are you, yes. you guys doing about that? Well, so Grid Engine has had since uh, 6.2 update to update. Five, I think, is where we brought in the uh, um, topology-aware scheduling. Yeah, it was update five. Um, so we, you have the ability now when you submit a, a, a job to say, and this is the way I want it bound. And uh, we used all the same uh, sorts of metrics as the uh, OpenMPI works, so you can have striding or you can have uh, linear or uh, – uh, there's a there's a third option that uh, escapes me at the moment for how you can specify your uh, uh, processor affinity, and that maps down to uh, uh, processor sets uh, in uh, Solaris and Linux. Um, of course, uh, uh, subject to the the uh, behavioral characteristics uh, of the operating system. So I believe it is on Linux that when you do a processor set, it's only that thing is allowed to run. No, it's the other way around. The uh, oh hell. I don't remember exactly the specifics of it. But, <laughs> I think Solaris uh, is more restrictive and, and better about it than Linux is. Yeah, that, I, they do it differently. That's all I yeah. that's that's all I can remember at the moment. But uh, yeah, so so anyway, it uh, maps down to the OS, and the OS is able to then uh, bind the processes to the cores as appropriate, and it also plays well with MPI. So there's an option that you can pass to the to the binding parameter that says, and by the way, this job is an open MPI job. So instead of trying to go do this yourself, just pass all this information off to OpenMPI and let it worry about it. And then how do you guys handle that in terms of, of scheduling? Like, does, does your application say, oh, I want, you know, every one of my executables to take an entire socket, and so I want 500 sockets, go figure it out. Or do they still have to express it in terms of, you know, say nodes and cores or whatever? So the, the uh, syntax expresses how you want to pick cores and sockets on the machines to which you are assigned. So it's essentially giving it a template for how to fill in a machine once you're assigned I a see. machine. I see. So, you know, I, I need four cores on the same socket, or I want the first core of each of the first four sockets, or wh wh whatever it is that you want. Or I just want four cores, and I don't really care where they land. Yeah. Um, the, so you, you uh, specify how on any given machine you would like things to be laid out, and we do our best to honor that. And you know, so that's, that's actually playing on one of, the, one of the other strengths of Grid Engine I uh, failed to mention before, which is the fact that uh, we have an extremely extensible resource model. Um, basically, anything that you can programmatically measure, we can treat as a resource and schedule against it. And the way that we're really doing the core binding is we're exposing the uh, topology of the machine as a resource. So when you go look at the machine and you've got a 16-socket machine the, the, that's you know, a, a quad quad, uh, you, if you go look at it, there'll be a, a topology resource, and the topology resource will say something like SCCCCC, SCCCC, SCCCC, SCCC, right, this long string that says it's a socket and four cores and a socket and four cores and a socket and four, you know, and, and that is uh, what we're using to schedule against it. I see. So will you actually then, uh, are, are you capable of scheduling, say, you know, 17 of those 32 cores to one job and then another five cores to a different job and then another seven cores to another and so on kind of kind of do a dense population, even though they might not be contiguous within the topology of that machine? Are you able to schedule and manage all that? Um, yeah, so it depends on your MPI configuration, but yes. So that, that falls under the way that you configure MPEI for uh, Grid Engine. 
Uh, it could be uh, that the MPI demands that every machine have the same number of uh, instances, same number of processes on it, um, or you could have a, just a, a fill-up pattern uh, that, that you would then have, you know, some on this machine and then spill over into some on the next and spill over into some on the next. And the, uh, in that case, the processor topology would be uh, uh, decided by that template that you provided, and once the template's exhausted, you just fill out whatever else is left. So what about like hyper threads? Can I submit a job and say like I want I'm okay using hyper threads or you know I don't want hyper threads? So given the flexibility of grid engine, I'm certain the answer is yes, but off the top of my head I don't actually <laughs> uh, th th there's no there's nothing built into the product that is um well actually that's not true the topology uh the topology where scheduling does um, so you might have a, uh, uh, a topology string that looks like S C T T C T T C T T C T T S C T right? So it, it's aware of the hyperthreading on the cores, uh, in which case you, you can actually schedule against that. And uh, for us, the way that we manage slots, right? Slots is just kind of an arbitrary concept. So you could have a, you know, a 16-core machine with one slot or a one-core machine with 128 slots. We we don't really care. You just tell us how many jobs you're allowed to run on the machine, and we'll we'll work it out. So does SGE have something so that when I install the daemon that goes on the cluster nodes, that it has a way to figure out what's this installed, that this is a dual socket quad core with hyper threads and has memory layout like this? Does it figure all that out? Does it use a library like HWLOC yeah. or something like that, or did you do it all yourself? Uh, I uh, so I, I don't believe we used a third-party library to do it. I'm actually not uh, um, intimately familiar with the uh, core binding um, uh, source code, but it is uh, handled automatically when you uh, uh, start up the execution even on the, the machine. It goes and figures out what the topology is. It queries the machine. So uh, you mentioned Solaris and Linux. Uh, do you support any other operating systems, or do you support any particular hardware, or what, what's your support matrix like? So we are completely hagware, um, hardware agnostic. Um, we, we don't care what uh, physical machine you run on. Uh, operating system support, um, we, so we run on anything that you would care to run it on. Um, so the, the official support matrix, let's see if I can recall uh, every uh, entry on it correctly. We've got Solaris, which we support every version of Solaris since Solaris 8, I believe. Uh, Linux, and we don't care what flavor or what version, as long as you've got at least a 2.4 kernel and a glibc of 2.3.2 or better. Um, we support AIX, we support HPUX, uh, Mac OS, Windows. Um, am I forgetting one? No, I think that's our current matrix. We actually just, uh, in the last year or so, dropped IRIX finally, because apparently no one cares anymore. And if you go out into the uh, open source, uh, you, you either grab the uh, Grid Engine open source or, or one of the forks, um, you get support for just about everything under the sun, uh, everything from SIGWIN uh, all the way up through uh, uh, Zeos. Zeos, wow. Hey, man, that's like the big mainframe operating system, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fancy. Yeah, so that, that falls into the, um, I think you had uh, mentioned in our emails offline, you know, what, looking for weird use cases of grid engine. That, that's actually one of them. Use grid engine on a, a big machine like a, a mainframe uh, to do scheduling. So uh, there, there are more than one single node grid engine clusters out there. So I, I don't know anything about mainframes, but it, it strikes me that that would probably come with their own, you know, vendor supplied resource manager or whatever kind of mechanism for running that stuff. Why would somebody run, you know, Grid Engine to do that on their mainframe? So I think that's a completely valid question. Quite honestly, on the mainframe use case, uh, I'm not entirely certain why um, that <laughs> they wanted to do that. But there was a customer that wanted to do that um, on a less than mainframe machine. You know, things like the uh, fair share scheduling and the uh, advance reservation and such uh, definitely does uh, make sense. And that may even be part of the uh, impetus for using it on a. Uh, on a mainframe. Yeah, so quite, quite honestly, I agree. I, I don't know why you'd be using Grid Engine on a mainframe, but somebody wanted to. <laughs> 
So what, what's the future for OGE? What's the positioning in Oracle's portfolio or any other features? Um, yeah, well, you know, so Oracle is exceedingly uh, tight-lipped about that sort of thing, so I, I can't get into very specific details, but we, we can kind of uh, uh, muse about what logically one could expect from a, a product like Grid Engine at a company like Oracle. Um, and and b before we go there, there's one other uh, comment I, I wanted to throw out there with regard to uh, whether Grid Engine is alive or dead, and, and that's that we have the ultimate in job security. Um, the the boat that Larry used to win the uh, America's Cup, uh, there's two firms that worked on it, uh, BMW Oracle Racing and uh, Cape Horn Engineering, uh, both of which use Grid Engine to, to do the uh, CFD for, for his boat. So we're uh, safe. <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, we're, we're Larry's uh, best friends now. Um, um, so the... Uh, <laughs> Going forward, looking at Grid Engine. Um, all right, so Grid Engine at Sun was always very HPC focused, right? We pushed that scalability boundary. It was the, is about power. It was it was about you know having the chainsaw with none of the safeties because damn it, we were pushing the cutting edge. And if you weren't bleeding, you weren't doing it right. Um, looking at Oracle, that's that's not really the way Oracle does things. Oracle is is very much very squarely focused on the enterprise. They're very squarely focused on IT. And quite frankly, we could use some of that. So if you look at where, where we're likely to be going with Grid Engine, uh, the, the big theme there is enterprising up the product, right? Um, making it integrate better into an enterprise IT environment, uh, making it friendlier to use, may, getting it to the point where you can hand it over to a knock operator who, you know, is doing this as a night job, um, you know, and doesn't know the first thing about uh, grid engine or distributed resource managers or, or jobs or anything else and could still look at an interface and figure out what's going on and know when to pick up the phone and call somebody to, for, for help. All right. So getting the product, uh, um, cleaned up, if you will, in a way that it is more enterprise palatable. Um, one of the other interesting things is if you look at the rest of the products in the Oracle portfolio, there's some really interesting synergies out there. Um, for example, go look at uh, Oracle Coherence, uh, formerly Tangasol Coherence up to a couple of years ago. Um, really brilliant technology. It's effectively a data grid. Uh, grid engine is a compute grid. Um, put them together, it's chocolate and peanut butter. I, I, that, that one's just dead obvious that, that we should be doing something with those guys. Uh, we landed in the enterprise manager organization, uh, actually specifically under the Ops Center uh, organization, so Ops Center being the systems management tool uh, uh, that, that uh, came from Sun and is now uh, uh, part of the Oracle story. So looking at that, I think it's also a fairly uh, a brain dead conclusion or a, a drop dead simple conclusion that that we're going to have some kind of uh, plug in into Enterprise Manager such that you can do your both your management of the grid environment and your management of all of your systems and by the way the management of your database and your BEA and your everything else all from one pretty web based UI. I, I think that's kind of a foregone conclusion. Uh, and there's there's a handful of other interesting technologies uh, uh, floating around Oracle, um, and and you know we're finding some odd uh, connections. Like for example, I did a session at Oracle Open World with the guys from the Oracle data mining team, uh, because they're looking at doing you know, data mining in a cloud environment, and so we actually had a demo of the Oracle data mining software, so a database with the data mining built in that was launching data mining jobs, which amounted to a SQL plus command through Grid Engine, and Grid Engine was automatically pulling machines out of Amazon EC2, firing up this AMI instance that had the uh, database already baked in, and then you know, running that SQL plus command against those uh, database instances, and then when they're done, letting the, the machines go. Right. That kind of use case, I think, is going to uh, show up more and more as we uh, uh, build, a, build out our uh, uh, Grid Engine offering under the, 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 the Oracle roof. Okay, Dan, well, thank you very much for your time here. Uh, will you personally be at SC? I, I absolutely will. So Oracle is going to have a booth at Supercomputing. It is going to be uh, largely storage-focused, but there will be a uh, cloud station there, and I will be stationed at the cloud station. 
Um, I'm actually scheduled for booth duty approximately 50% of the conference, but uh, I have no life when I'm at these conferences, so I tend to hang out the, at the booth unless I'm talking to customers. So uh, if you're looking for me, come find me at the booth. I will probably be there, and I'll be looking for an excuse to not be at the booth. So uh, happy you're to talk. You're scheduled to be there. <laughs> okay, well, we'll all be walking around there, so we'll have to drop by and say hi sometime and actually meet some of our guests face-to-face. We're always looking forward to that. Actually, Jeff and I Indeed. will be doing some – different from normal recording and providing of information on the show after the SC conference. So we'll be cranking out some. Yeah. We kind of neglected uh, to mention this up front. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to do a few different things this year. So listen for upcoming stuff in RCE from, uh, you know, live SC coverage or at least on site SC coverage. Not yeah. I mean, I'll definitely be tweeting. I'm not very good at it. Um, but you can, you know, I'll be, I'll be tweeting from my Twitter handle, which you can find on the RCE website or just Brock Palin, all one word. Okay. Well, again, thanks for your time, Daniel. I, I think this is very useful and I, I hope, uh, this clears up a lot of the confusion out there in the community about what's going on with OGE. Yeah, I hope so as well. Thanks for having me on, guys. Thank you. Okay. And we'll see everybody at SC in uh, about a week.